Hello, Monetization Nation. I am live streaming from Funnel Hacking Live 2021, and it's the end of day three. We're in Orlando, Florida. And uh, for those of you that aren't aware, Funnel Hacking Live, I believe, is the best digital marketing and entrepreneurship uh, conference in the world. It's uh, referred to by those of us who love it as kind of the Super Bowl of entrepreneurship and marketing. Uh, super motivating today, super inspiring. Today was a day that left us feeling invincible. I think that's a, a good word to describe it. The first speaker today was Kiana Danielle. The average CEO, she said, is just three paychecks away from filing bankruptcy. She only earned the 2CCX award one year ago but she now has $4 million in her retirement account, and she showed us that. She also gave us a disclaimer that she's not providing financial ad advice, and as I'm reporting on her, I am I'm not providing any, any kind of financial advice or recommendations. I'm just reporting uh, what she said in her speech. At 18, well, before that, she was born in Iran, and at 18, she moved to Japan uh, to go to school. So Farsi was her first language, Japanese was her second. Uh, later, she moved to New York City, the heart of global finance, and was very passionate about finance and investing. She was living in an apartment on the Upper West Side, like she'd seen in Gossip Girls and Sex in the City, only she was fired from her job. And a few days later, her boyfriend dumped her, and then she ran out of money to pay for her rent. She hit rock bottom. She felt like a failure. She wasn't proficient in English and wasn't employable. She had a falling out with her family. She had a welfare diva mentality, as she said it. She began at that moment her invest diva journey. She was featured on a lot of national television shows, but secretly she was broke. To the world, she seemed like an up and coming celebrity, but she really had no money to show for it. She gave an example of other celebrities that fall into the same dilemma such as Lady Gaga, who went bankrupt and was $3 million in debt after her Monster Ball tour. People would ask her, if investing, if you're so good at investing, why are you broke? Uh, she talked about how investing is so great because it helps you uh, make your money work for you. She said that time is the key ingredient for investing. She said that day trading is gambling and does not encourage day trading. In fact, she made the whole audience promise to not do day trading. She's all about long-term investing, and that strategy allows the compounding effect to help you because it's making your money work for you over time. She talked about the wealth ecosystem, um, and she was building and doing a lot of things for her investment and for her career, but the key thing that she was missing, she discovered, was the funnel. And when she finally discovered how good a funnel can be and how much uh, more effective it can be in generating the revenue, she became angry. Uh, she even joked, uh, do you know how much compounding income I lost because Russell was busy selling potato guns 15 years ago instead of teaching me about funnels? She would have liked to learn about funnels a long time earlier before she discovered it. She then went funnel crazy. She said, funnel obsessed is, is uh, good, but funnel crazy is bad. And part of, as part of her funnel crazy, she launched 145 different funnels, but she was still not making any money. And so she posted, posted about it on one of the ClickFunnels Facebook groups and Russell Brunson responded to her post personally. And he advised her, you're doing too much. Focus on one thing. Uh, he told her to run Facebook ads to one group of people to help resolve one valuable, painful problem. So she decided that she wanted to help moms take control of their financial future, and she deleted all of the funnels. She stopped promoting her cryptocurrency book, um, which, which she felt lost her a significant amount of money. She focused on one funnel, and one group of people. After 10 years of making almost zero money in her business, she, with this new strategy, went very quickly to making a million dollars from that funnel. The funnel after the funnel 
is like compounding in the financial world. Uh, she talks about compounding and why that's so good because it's, it's like helping your money, as she said, have babies and then grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It's, it's helping uh, reproduce and regenerate uh, that money. She advised to not spend the money but invest the money. And then we can live off of what comes from the investment instead of living off of the seed capital. She told us that the goal is passive income. She told us that my web, her webinar funnel has become the cash cow machine for all of her investment accounts. The next speaker for the day was Pedro Adeo. And I say it a little bit funny because in Portuguese, that's pronounced Adão, which is the Portuguese word for Adam, but he pronounces it Adeo. And he talked about how we can crush it with challenges. Now, this talk was really good. I think this was the best non-Russell talk uh, that has been given at the conference so far. And, and I received tons of value for it. In fact, I, I feel I received so much value that this talk alone was worth the entire cost that I've paid to attend this conference. He talked about how to fast track our way to the Two Comma Club and beyond with challenges. At the last Funnel Hacking Live, he came as a financial advisor, so he hasn't even been doing this very long. Today, he's the category king of challenges. His book, I believe, is called Challenge Secrets, or his, his course. Um, I need to look into it, and I, I wrote myself a big action item that I need to go subscribe for, um, for his course, his offering, and, and learn what he has to teach. To take, I'm sure it's a challenge, so go take his challenge course. So Pedro, before challenges, was living in obscurity. He was doing free retirement events in Northern California. With challenges, he's been able to create two Category King businesses. Um, he said that they became an eight-figure-a-year business in just their second full year online. That's ridiculous. Think about that. An eight-figure-a-year business uh, in their second year online. How many companies can claim that? They launched two different companies from scratch that have reached seven figures. And the life he's living today, he couldn't have even dreamed of. He couldn't have even dreamed of 10% of it, he, he said. A podcast host asked him, uh, where can my listeners get more of this? So this was in the very early days when, when he was just, for the very first time, telling people about challenges. And uh, he told the podcast host um, a URL that he had. And he didn't have anything built at that URL, and the podcast was going to go live in three days. So he had three days to build his funnel. And he did that, and thus was launched a, a very successful career in business. So he said that Russell Brunson reads a whole bunch of different business books from many different experts, and then Russell took the best parts of it and created his book, Extra, Expert Secrets. And so he feels that instead of having to read all those same business books as Russell, he just reads Expert Secrets over and over and over again. He talks about the things he did not have before launching his first free uh, masterclass, or his challenge, as he calls it. Um, and this is the one he created in three days. He didn't have a logo. He didn't have an offer. He didn't have an email list. He didn't have an audience of any kind. He had no automation, and he only spent $3,000 in ads. He taught that if you have money, buy ads. But if you don't have money, put in the work and get organic traffic. He said that many people, um, or excuse me, he said when you create this challenge course, this model that he has, that we should make people apply to get access to the free challenge. He had about 300 people that he had gathered in his group and that about 100 people or so were engaged. He said about 30 of those people ended up joining and paying $995 for a 12-month membership. He said and, and repeated this multiple times, he felt that God tricked him into launching a movement based on a business on accident that now has impacted hundreds of thousands of people in more than 93 different countries. But more importantly to him, he found his people. He advised us to stop doing pre-recorded stuff in our challenges. Um, he says, when you, when you find your people, you will find your purpose. When you find your purpose, it's game over. 
He said that you can only find your purpose when you find your people. And he targeted faith-based entrepreneurs. And there, there were actually multiple speakers today that were targeting a faith-based audience, and they seem to be some of the most speakers of the day. So if you are a faith-based person and you are not talking about your faith, uh, you might want to reconsider that. It may be a good um, audience for you there as, as you connect with them through that shared passion. He discussed um, the, the concept, what if you were born for such a time as this? And that's from the scripture that talks about Esther. And, and maybe we were born with a mission to help people, uh, was his point. And he had some success and was successful in, in one specific place that he had taught and then four masterminds contacted him in one week because of that success. And then Dean Graciosi contacted him. And, and Pedro has now brought challenges into the modern era. He's crushed 52 challenges in a row. He's received approximately an 8 to 1 lifetime return on ad spend. So for every dollar spent, they've had $8 of revenue generated as a result. He then went on to explain what is a challenge. And a challenge happens over a period of time. Usually, he says five to 90 days. Um, I've seen them usually happening shorter, but he's, um, he's definitely the expert. I'm not. He says that they create an urgency. They're time-based, that everybody in the challenge commits to attacking an, the action. Or excuse me, he said that everyone in the challenge commits to taking the action. Uh, in that challenge, we deliver live, daily, actionable training. He says it's very results-driven, and it focuses on one primary outcome. We focus on helping people get a quick win through that challenge. Through that challenge, we help them overcome obstacles with daily assignments that build momentum. He said the challenges get your ideas, your ideal customers to actually consume your stuff so they can actually get results. He said the challenges make marketing simple because if you're actually really good at what you do, and your product really does help people, then why not just prove it by helping people for free before even ever asking them to invest any real kind of money? And, and that's a different concept than I've heard before. Most people that I've heard teaching about challenges recommend that you charge $37 or $47 for that challenge. And he seemed to be encouraging that we offer our challenge for free uh, to build that relationship so we can get a lot more people in the door and get them successful and then get them to buy uh, where, our, where we generate our real revenue. He said that one of the benefits of a well-executed challenge course is that we can build trust. He said that with one challenge, we can go through an entire value ladder in five days. So in other words, as we have different products and services, we may have a book and a course and a membership site and a consulting business or a coaching business. As we as we go through this challenge course, we can be promoting each of those different elements of our business. Uh, and I apologize, he, towards the end of his presentation, was going really fast to meet a time deadline, and he, he went through a lot of slides that I was not able to capture. So the presentation is far better than what I'm reporting here, and I highly recommend you, you go take his probably his challenge course on creating challenge courses. Funnel hackers believe that they're called to serve, and service to many leads to greatness, according to Pedro. He said that anyone can serve, therefore anyone can be great. And he said challenges give you an ability to serve at scale. He also said a point that I love. As you know, I'm very passionate about this concept of, of just loving, and love is, is the core answer to many of the problems we face. He said that whoever loves the customer the most will win. And again, I, I think that presentation was worth, worth uh, everything I paid for this conference. Peng Jun spoke next. Peng, Jin, Peng Jun spoke at the last Funnel Hacking Live, and he, he gave a keynote, and he turned that keynote into a two comma club revenue stream. He said that it used to be we bought a product for $10 and they paid $5 for shipping. Then Amazon came along and said that you pay $15 and you get free shipping. 
And then Russell Brunson came along and offered a free product plus shipping. And in his presentation, he was going to show us a new model. Three years ago, he gave a 28-minute keynote. He then turned that keynote into a book and a funnel. And he, in his presentation, was focusing on how we can turn anything we're doing into a funnel, an asset that works for us forever. He taught that the two most important numbers are CPA, which is, excuse me, which is basically the cost to acquire a customer. The second most important number is the ACV, which is the av what the average customer is worth to you. And, and these are the numbers that I've talked about. Um, I believe I talked about them in, in the report for day one of Funnel Hacking Live. And I believe it was Russell Brunson that was talking about those. Uh, he said that the goal is to build a system where you, it's a money machine, where you put in $1 and you get $2 out. He said that he took a presentation, turned it into a book, the front end product um, within an order bump was for a masterclass for $37. And then he had an upsell, which was a recurring subscription for $97. And the average customer was worth $80 to him. For every dollar he put into the front end offer, he caught, got $2 out. However, that doesn't take into consideration the revenue generated on the back end. And so he spent $41 to acquire a customer who was buying an $80 product. He said that that doesn't include that he built a list of $63,000, excuse me, 63,000 leads doing this marketing. So now he had a valuable asset in those leads. It also doesn't include the fact that he had $16,000 and that he's, he's generated 1,500 recurring buyers who are paying $97 a month. He says this is a very specific formula that he replicated um, this funnel multiple times for different topics. He said that once he gets a buyer in, um, he can ascend them to his other funnels, his webinars, high ticket funnels, etc. He said that the old way was to run ads to a webinar, an application, or event funnel. But the new way is to get paid up front and then you ascend your customer to another funnel. He said that you can have a buyer's only webinar. Um, and the new way is in the membership area to split the webinar into a four-part series. He said that rather do, than doing that 90-minute webinar, you, you chop it into four. Um, I'm going to just skip through some of this. A lot of, lot of great deal. Uh, excuse me, a lot of great value. Uh, another thing that really stood out to me was the pyramid of value. So he talked about DIY, and there's a lot of customers at the lowest level and the greatest group of customers that kind of want to do it themselves, like a book or a course, and that's the DIY audience. Then there's the DWY audience, that's the done with you audience. They want some hand-holding, and this may be group coaching and um, coaching programs, that kind of thing. Then there's the DFY program, that's the done for you program. And that's basically fill in the blanks, right? Do get, you know, X, Y, and Z here, and then, then we take care of the rest to do everything start to finish. Um, he talked about how the front-end offer is usually a DIY offer. Um, then you have an order bump. Then you go to a DWY offer next. And then at the highest level, you, you try to upgrade a portion of that audience to a DFY offer. He talked about how a book is not going to retire him, but a $97 recurring membership may. He, he talked about how in this type of funnel, you're not selling a course. He said that information alone is not enough. Instead, we're selling the other things around the information, like the accountability, the execution, the people, the network. And if we can bundle these things in with our offer, that's how we'll really succeed with that offer. He said that you need to find everything you are doing in life and repurpose it. And he gave some examples of um, him with his book in front of Gaston and said that Gaston would have closed the sale with Bell if he would have read his book, right? Where he's using examples of things he's already doing in everyday life and using those to market to his audience. The next speaker was Lauren Golden. Lauren is the CEO and founder of the Free Mama Movement. She said that you don't have to choose between family and financial freedom as a mom anymore. She took the perfect webinar script and she added the perfect webinar funnel to it. 
She also created a Facebook group that reached 35, that has 35,000 members while raising three kids. In 2014, her second child was born and she was waiting for someone at that time in her life to kind of tell her what to do. She kept watching other people's webinars over and over again, but nothing had changed. She really hadn't taken action to create anything herself. And at that time, she bought a course from Liz Benny and began to be a social media manager. Um, but she had voices in her head. She had the, the internal voice that was telling her she's not ready, that she didn't know enough, that she's not good enough. We all kind of have that imposter syndrome, the kind of the self-doubt. Um, then a, a little bit later, Liz Benny did another webinar and she had built trust and confidence in Liz from the first webinar. And when this new one came out, she knew she was going to buy it even before she attended and, and really knew the details of what it was about. She said at this time she had no money, like no money, no following, no time. Um, but she said you can start with nothing as long as you have a fire to motivate you to do something and you can make it work. She trusted that Liz would help her and, and she made that investment. And she's developed what she calls a four-step re-enrollment register, excuse me, a four-step re-enrollment webinar framework. Uh, I'm going to skip through a few of these. Um, she talks about uh, the importance of going live to your group every week. You need to have that consistency to, to connect with your group and, and build that community. You need to be providing that value. They need to have the face time with you. Um, she said you may be uncomfortable about going live, but if you want to lead a community, you need to do it anyway. You're not going to get the end result without showing up and doing it consistently. She says, and the whole time she's been doing it, she's only missed one of her scheduled lives and she had someone from her team cover for her. She said that great leaders help people to reach their goals. You don't need to do or to know everything to be perfect or to be ready, uh, but you need commitment and you need consistency. She said, even if you aren't getting a lot of engagement at the beginning, people are watching. When you show up for your community, people will then ultimately show up for you. She said that we need to promise people how we're going to serve them and then do it. She encouraged us to put the information about that weekly live stream in our Facebook group header so, so you can promote it very well to the audience. She encourages us to engage with the people who are engaging with you as people comment and like and share, you know, comment back with them. She talked about how she took those, she calls them ULAs, but those are the lives that she did. And she turned them into podcasts. She repurposed them and used that information in other ways. She talked about how she tries to make everyone feel seen and heard. And she reiterated the quote from Dan Kennedy, the company that can spend the most to acquire the customer wins. That is absolutely positively the most quoted quote from Funnel Hacking Live. I bet I've heard that six times already, at least by day three, including from Dan Kennedy himself, who was our last speaker last night. And that was just kind of ridiculous, surreal to hear from the GOAT, the greatest of all time uh, marketer who, who spoke to us live last night. She talked about the importance of nurturing people while you're cultivating your community so, so that they can turn into a community, nurture those relationships. Um, I'm skipping through some of these, trying to get you to the highlights. She talked about, in conclusion, that if you remain fiercely loyal to your mission and the people who you serve, then they will be insanely loyal back to you. Our next speaker was Sarah Petty. She talked about who puts Michael Jordan on the bench. Her daughter came to her and told her mom, there's an open spot on the varsity volleyball team and I want it. And I believe she was a freshman at the time, maybe a sophomore. And as entrepreneurs, we really don't subscribe to the wait in line method, right? The, the freshman or the sophomore who's trying to get that spot on the varsity team we don't just say, okay, let's wait till it's our turn, right? We we're, we're, are constantly trying to, to grab that opportunity. 
So with her daughter, she thought it was a long shot, but she told her daughter, someone's got to get the spot, so why can't it be you? Be you? Her daughter wanted to work out with a trainer named Rico. Um, and Rico was the trainer where the serious athletes trained, and he pushed his athletes hard. And the athletes know about prehab. It's the work you put in before you perform so that you can prevent injury. And when you only have a few years in high school or a few years in college, uh, the athletes know that if you lose one year, it can, it can make a massive difference in your sports career. So prehab is the way to avoid this. So she talked again about if you're the coach, do you leave your best player on the bench? Um, and she, she drew, drew the parallel back to entrepreneurship. And as an entrepreneur, who is, what is my best player? And do I have them in the game or do I have them on the bench? She used the analogy of, of a workout and how the workout tears down our muscles and causes discomfort, right? We know that as, as pain, right? Where you can't walk for, for a few days. Um, as entrepreneurs, what we want is on the other side of that discomfort. And, and she gave one example of that as being sales. Her punchline with her daughter was that her daughter won that one spot on the varsity team. But as entrepreneurs, what is that one best player? What are the, the things that we have in our business? What are our assets? What are our talents? What are our strengths that we may have sitting on the bench? And how do we get them out on the floor to play that game for us? When she had her twins, she quit her job and she decided to turn her photography hobbit, hobby into a jobby, as she says. She priced herself really low initially. Um, she was really busy and was getting a lot of referrals from people, but she wasn't making a lot of profit. She realized that she'd given up a really kind of cushy nine to five job with vacation and benefits for a 24 seven volunteer job where she wasn't really making a profit. She decided that she was not going to work the next 18 years of her life this way. So. Most of the businesses, most of businesses out there have to compete with cheap competitors. As a photographer, it's even harder, she says, because she has to compete with free because everybody has a digital camera. So they went boutique, they went high end, and they developed a model uh, teaching clients how to sell wall portraits for two to five thousand dollars. So you go take pictures, but then you're selling a high end portrait that can go into their home. For 10 years, she'd only so, sold low ticket, but she realized that the best player she was leaving on the bench was her muscle to serve. She realized that they needed a coaching program with a high ticket offer. So she created a virtual live event. They now have a high ticket coaching program with more than 150 students. Um, they have 1,200 attendees at their event, and 97% of those attendees attended all three days. That's super impressive. I've done a summit before and didn't have anywhere near those numbers. Uh, she went through a lot of, of details about her swag, ba swag box that she sent to all of the attendees, and it was super cool. Um, she gave them time-release swag notes that were to be opened at different times. She gave them a head trash, trash can that they could take their head trash thoughts, the negative self-defeating thoughts and put them into the trash can. She gave them an um, intention bracelet where people can write down uh, what they really want and put it into the bracelet. She, she gave them stickers to put on their mirrors. She was really trying to kind of occupy all of that different real estate. At her event, she also gave away Julie Awards. In her business, she had a Julie. That was the name of one of her clients that paid her a lot of money and really helped her get going at the beginning. And so she gives away a Julie Award when people reach $1,000 orders or more. Um, she developed a gamification system. So she, she wanted to help her customers close the gap from where they were and where she was trying to help them become. And so she created a dashboard with all of the different criteria for reaching those goals and closing that gap. And as they were going through the event, you know, they all started off red as not reaching the goal and the client could change the colors of the goals to help get them all to green, kind of gamifying the, the progress she was trying to help them receive. She also, excuse me, she also talked about a scholarship funnel. 
um, where where people could apply for attending apply to attend the event that had a $495 value people gave her a $99 refundable deposit to apply for for that program she wanted to make sure that people actually attended if they received the scholarship and and uh, she didn't want to send out books and things to those people if if they weren't going to actually participate and they got the money they could get the money back if they if they actually attended the event and then at the event, she made it very easy for people to donate that $99 to Operation Underground Railroad, and they raised an awful lot of money for that organization. But the, the really important takeaway, I mean, I guess it's, it is really important that she donated a lot of money to a really good cause. In addition to that good cause, um, she had 22% of her buyers come from those free tickets. So you might consider how do, how do you get people really serious um, about coming with some kind of refundable deposit and you still can convert those people back to your back end offer. I'm, I'm scrolling through a, a really cool story of Taylor Swift. She, she helped her, her kids um, do something really cool at a Taylor Swift concert, and then her kids were invited backstage with Taylor Swift. Um, and she told a story about Taylor Swift. She said that 11 years old, Taylor Swift was asked to sing the national anthem at a, a live event. I don't remember what it was, maybe a, a baseball game or something. And then the next day, she went to middle school. And she went and got her food at the cafeteria and then sat down at the table. And all of her friends got up and moved. And then the next weekend, she asked her friends to go to the mall, but her friends said she couldn't. So she went to the mall with her mom and saw those girls there at the mall. And, and she just talked about how heartbroken Taylor Swift was at that time. But Taylor Swift's now worth $400 million. And she just encouraged us. Her point was to keep going. Um, where are you gonna be three years from now? And uh, the next speaker was Eileen Wilder. And this was an amazing talk. If you have access to these talks, I highly recommend you listen to this one. She, ta she asked at the beginning of her talk, how many of you would like premium high ticket buyers lined up out the door around the building waiting to pay you a fortune? She acquired a tribe of high ticket buyers who are excited to pay top dollar prices. And she, the, purpose of the presentation was to teach us how to do that as well. She, she was specifically teaching us what she did to, hit the two, to achieve the Two Comma Club Award in four months and how she reached a $55,000 VIP day as well. She said before Funnel Hacking Live 2018, she was a quote unquote normal person. She said that her husband was an Uber driver and that they were broke. And she was a pastor. And you could tell that from her speaking style. She had a very engaging, very energetic speaking style. And where she became very excited with ClickFunnels, where she realized that she can save the world, like she was passionate about, and still make money. So over the next two years, uh, using funnel hacking, she she has received multiple Two Comma Club awards. And in this presentation, she taught about the three simple step, three step simple funnel that we can use to remove the overwhelm and help get a t high ticket client that works like crazy pants, as she said. So the focus here was about high ticket, selling high ticket products. And when you sell low ticket products, you've got to kind of get your copy done really well and your ads done really well and your pricing of, you know, there's so many things you have to get done right. And she said, you have so much more margin for error if you focus on a high ticket funnel. She talked about W. Clement Stone, who was a very good friend of Napoleon Hill. W. w. Clement Stone made a lot of money in his career and, and and was a self-made, extremely wealthy man who donated a lot of money to charity. And he attributed his success to one phrase. And that phrase is, do it now. 
And he said that phrase, do it now, to himself 100 times per day. And he had all of his employees say, do it now, to themselves 100 times per day. She taught that successful people make decisions quickly and change them very slowly. She taught, she gave a quote from herself that procrastination is the assassination of your destination. So she made a funnel with the, after she went to that funnel hacking life, she came home and she just did it. She did it now, right? At the moment. And she made a funnel and it didn't look great. She showed us the funnel and it had a button um, to a book with a call to action and she charged $297. She had a video and then she had a call to, to book an appointment, to book a call. And she charged at the beginning $297 and it sold. So she raised the price and it sold and she raised it again to $2,000 and to $4,000 and finally $6,000 for this, for this uh, high ticket uh, call. And with 12 people in the room, they hit six figures in one day from, from just one of her pushes to sell uh, her high ticket offer. She talked a lot about quantum leaps and said there exists in you the ability to, to make a quantum leap. She said that the enemy is your thoughts. The enemy has a primary goal to keep us broke and busted and disgusted. She says it's not about you. It's about your calling and those that you're called to reach, to preach to, and to, to serve. The enemy knows that if he can rob you of your identity, he will rob you of your legacy. So her advice is to punch him in the face. It's funny, my wife likes to say that as well. Just punch him in the face. Uh, one day, excuse me, the, the one day cash machine is the brand name of their high ticket funnel. And she says it's kind of like having a fast pass. She talked about how people are willing to pay a lot more to get something faster. That's why they're willing to pay for a, a coach who can help them get to some place much faster. And, and the reason for that in my business is when you have those wealthier people, time becomes their most precious commodity. So they're paying for someone who can help them reduce the time that it takes to achieve the success they're looking for. She says that sometimes we buy into the lie that we have to start with a low ticket before we go to a high ticket product. She gave the story of Elon Musk who helped prove that wrong. Uh, he wrote out his business model and he's executed almost all of that business model. And his business model was to start off with a high price, low volume car. So a car that was very expensive that he didn't sell a lot of. And then he used that money to build a medium cost car. And then he used that money to buy a to create an even lower cost car. This is called a descension funnel instead of an ascension funnel. She said, often we think we have to start at the bottom of the funnel, but that is not true. She said, it can kind of, now let me skip through that. Uh, she encouraged us to start with a high ticket product. And if you have a huge margin, um, you can be bad at ads, you can be bad at copy, and you can be serving your clients at the highest level. When you're making more money, from a client, you can afford to put a lot more effort into serving that customer. She quoted Russell Brunson as saying, people who pay, pay attention. And so she wants to attract the customers who pay more, so they're going to pay a lot more attention to the process. She quoted Matthew 6.21, which says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When you go high ticket, you are inviting the heart into it. She talked about our inse internal insecurity. And she said that is not market reality. Your internal insecurity is not market re reality. And that was a quote from Bruchard, I believe. Uh, she talked about the offer you don't make, no one can take. Kind of like the shot that you never take, you'll never make. She also quoted Dan Kennedy, the business that can spend the most to acquire a customer wins. Um, the client who was only charging a few hundred dollars. Okay, this is a great story. Uh, she had one client who came to her who was providing marriage connection services, right? Matchmaking. And she was only charging a few hundred dollars for this service. 
And she told her customer, this client, that she should be charging a lot more, selling a high ticket funnel for matchmaking. This is high passion, high value to find someone to love and create a family and have babies, that kind of thing. And, and she advised her to sell it for $10,000 instead of a few hundred dollars. And her client was uh, concerned. She said, well, I can't even, s I'm having a real hard time selling it for a few hundred dollars. How am I ever going to sell it for $10,000? But she tried it. She trusted her coach. And within one week, actually within one day, according to my notes here, she brought in five new clients. So she was working with another customer and she encouraged her, that customer to increase his price. And he was really skeptical. And she, they were talking about raising the price of his product to $30,000. And he, he didn't know if he could do that. And so she talked to him about how he can 10x the value of what he provided to his customers. And, and he actually held the event in a castle and, and made it so amazing. And he sold 16 customers to that event at $30,000 each. She encouraged us to focus on people over products, excuse me, people over profits and relationships over revenue. The next speaker was Nick Santonas. Tasso. I'm sure I butchered that name. I'm so sorry. Um, Nick was born with no legs and one arm. He was so impressive. Um, he had many people, including maybe even myself, in, in tears in his presentation. Um, when he was born, he only had a 30% chance of living. He said that great, great leaders ask great questions. He asked, are you here to expedite your process? Are you, are you listening to him as a speaker to expedite the process? Again, going back to people are willing to pay for a fast pass. He talked about growth being uncomfortable. And, and he talked about why is change so hard? If it were easy, we would each be living our dream life. So why do we flip-flop? Why do we set goals that we know are going to help us get where we need to be and then we don't do what we need to do to achieve those goals. He said that most of our beliefs stemmed from ages zero to seven. During that time, our brain was very suggestible. He said that most of us can agree we didn't have the perfect childhood. If we had, we, but if we had had the perfect childhood, we wouldn't have become who we are today. He said by the age 35, that by the age 35, 95% of our thoughts words and actions are on autopilot. He asked, for example, have you ever gone through your day and snapped at someone without really thinking about it? That's the autopilot. Or maybe you've been addicted to negative emotions like anger and stress. That's the autopilot from our younger years. Um, he asked if you've ever gone through your day and, and then something happens and it makes you remember something from your past and kind of triggers emotions within you. That's the the autopilots, the software as he calls it. He said that your software wants what's comfortable. He, it doesn't want change. It wants us to, to do um, what we've done before and what we're comfortable with. He said if you try to change your life, often your brain sabotages you. He says people naturally, our brain goes back to what we know. He said be aware when your mind is trying to sabotage your growth. What you focus on expands you'll get more of, and you'll feel more of. So he said we should focus on things that we have instead of things that we don't have. We should focus on gratitude. He did an exercise at the end where he had us focus on gratitude. And before the exercise, we wrote down kind of our stress and anxiety level. And, and then he took us through this focusing on gratitude exercise and, and uh, the noticeable difference that we all had, had by the end. Um, that was a wonderful exercise. He said we should focus on the things we can control. And some of those things we can control are our software and, and what we are consuming on a daily basis. We can control our focus and we can control the people that we surround ourselves with. He told the story of when he was younger of a girl on a school bus who was making fun of all the kids on the bus. And then when she got to him, she said that she didn't even have to start with him because he was already too messed up. And, and how that really devastated him. He talked about how with entrepreneurs, there's always the next level of life. 
And he said that the quality of our life comes down to the quality of the questions that we ask ourselves on a daily basis. And that's a a quote from Tony Robbins. He said that maybe the disability that he has is a good thing. Because for him, for example, as he's focusing on the positive, it helps filter the people out of his life that he doesn't want in his life anyway. If people don't want to be his friend and, and connect with him because he doesn't have any legs and only one arm, then maybe those aren't the people that he wanted in his life anyway. He encouraged us to identify the event or scenarios in our past that are holding us back. And then ask ourselves the golden question, um, what did we learn from that situation? What did we gain from those situations? Once we find those lessons and those gifts, we can liberate ourselves, liberate ourselves from those pains. He went back to that girl on the bus and he, he talked about kind of how we don't need to hold our anger towards her because hurt people hurt people. And think about what she was going through in her home that made her lash out to the kids on the bus in that way. He said, it's not you, it's them. He said that for him, he found that the secret sauce he was looking for was found in confidence. And then that comes through with the things, excuse me, that, con- that confidence comes from following through with the things that you say you're going to do. He said that confidence and self-work are the secrets to your success. How many times have you told yourself that you're going to exercise, start a funnel, start a business, quit a job, and then you don't do it? And then when you break one promise, it's really easy to quit the commitment altogether. And then that becomes the downward spiral for us. He encourages us to do the things that we don't want to do to override our programming or our software that we already have ingrained in us. He told a story of when Vine came out, you know, that app where you could post those six second videos. And so he became a zombie, pretended to be a zombie in Walmart and had someone film him crawling on the ground as a zombie with no legs and one arm and uh, scaring people, scaring a man. And he wanted to see if he could get 500 people to see the video had a friend record it for him and was very successful in scaring the man. He said he also is never allowed in that Walmart ever again. He said the next morning, the video had more than 80,000 likes and 80,000 shares. He said from this story that we need to find our unique strengths and abilities. People don't associate with perfect. They see that as a BS life. He says we need to to be real and authentic and and communicate that. He also talked about through the exercise that he did, how it's impossible to feel grateful and sad at the same time, or feel grateful and angry at at the same time. So one of the secrets of overcoming those negative emotions like sadness and anger is to focus on gratitude. Then Russell Brunson came to stage and Russell spoke to us about the secrets of success, the science of achievement, and the art of fulfillment. And this is a new book that he's writing. He said that many people achieve the biggest things, uh, winning the Olympics or, or building a huge company, and then they're still not fulfilled in their life. You know, they, they just didn't think it was going to feel that way when they finally achieved the pinnacle they'd been working for all of those, li- those years. Tony Robbins said, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. He said that achievement plus fulfillment is the ultimate success. And that's what his book is about, how we can have achievement and fulfillment at the same time to achieve that success. Looking forward a lot to reading that book. He told the story of a mastermind that he went to with some of the world's top influencers. And it was an event horizon. They did things that just transformed their experience. They kind of defined their lives by what happened before that event and what happened after that event. And then they went back and tried to do that event at the same location. And it, it was not an event horizon. And he said, when you repeat the same activities, the brain starts to delete things. You start to forget things when you do them over and over again. 
he questioned how much of his life is deleted because he's doing the same thing over and over again every day. So we need to stop this by creating event horizons in our lives, like coming to Funnel Hacking Live. So he shared a few secrets with us. Uh, secret number one was the invisible battle between, between your brain and your body. He says that our brain weighs about 2% of our body weight, but consumes about 20 to 40% of the calories of our body. He said that chess players, I didn't, know, I didn't actually know that. I didn't know that our brain consumed that many calories at all or hardly any calories. I assumed it was from, from large muscles and such. He said that chess players can consume as many calories as people who run marathons. He said, when we get a choice, our brain tries to find a way to say no so that it doesn't have to use as much energy. Kind of like when I was getting ready for this podcast, it's late, it's, what time is it? It's 1.40 in the morning after, a, after the show and I had to go through my notes and it, it took a lot of energy. My brain was saying no, um, uh, but I kept my commitment and I promised that I would... I would uh, publish this show um, each night after Funnel Hacking Live. So I'm doing that and, and going against my brain that's trying to stop me. He talked about how perfect practice makes perfect. He talked about how by the time you're 35 years old, 95% of your choices are happening subconsciously. And so we have to learn to rewire the 95%. Secret number two he talked about was understanding why you do what you do. He talked about the six human needs that we have. And four of those six needs are needs of the body. And one of those is certainty. One of those is variety, which is actually uncertainty. One of those is significance. And one of those is connection and love. He said that the quality of our life is in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty that you can live with. And that was a quote from Tony Robbins. He said that whenever three of those four needs that I just said are met, that it will create addictions in our lives. He gave the example of, of going on a date and you go on a date and, and you get several of those needs fulfilled, right? You, you have variety. You might go to a restaurant that you've never tried before or try an activity you've never tried or meet a person you've never met before. He talked about significance where that person um, likes being with you and, and feels that you're neat. He talked about the connection and the love that you may feel, right? That may be three of, of those um, needs that is filled by that person as we date that person and, and it builds loving relationships and, and can end in, in marriage and such. Um, he talked about that as, as time goes on, that sometimes those things go away. We stop spending time with the person. The variety goes away. And, and we stay in the marriage for a while just based on certainty, right? It's the same thing happening over and over again. And he says that's a recipe when we allow that to happen of, of marriages that can fall apart. Russell talked about how his business is an absolute addiction for him and how it fills so many of those different needs. Russell talked about the hero journey. Um, and we've, we've read about that in his books a lot um, and how every hero goes on two journeys. One of those journeys is a journey to achieve something and the other journey is a journey to become something or, or fulfillment. Secret number four that he shared is finding our why and why that's so important. And he talked about the 1% crazy of people who take responsibility for and to pay the payroll of, of families with children. He said, if you're going to go down that path, um, uh, let me skip through some of this here. He talks about how entrepreneurs can't shut it off, that they're, that they're the 1% crazy. He talked about starting with the why and then moving outward um, and having the why at the core, and that helps us get through the hard things. Um, helps us go from good. What helps us go from good to champion is that extra 20% that other people aren't putting into it. And the why, understanding the why, helps us to um, have the energy to, and the focus to put in that extra 20%, right? It's the, 
uh, it's the wrestler who goes running in the evening after he's already done hours of, of practice uh, because he knows his, his opponents are, are uh, putting a lot of effort as well and he knows he needs to do more than them if he wants to beat them. Secret number five he talked about was finding your guide. Um, when you pick a guide, you've got to put blinders on. You've got to basically just do whatever they say. Uh, secret number six he talked about becoming worthy of your goal. Um, so he talked about identity. We may identify as an entrepreneur, a mom, a dad, an athlete, something like that. He said that all of these identities have flaws. And the, the one, and the reason they have flaws is because they can stop, right? If you see yourself as an athlete and then you get injured, you could be devastated and it could crush you when, when your identity is destroyed. He said that the one identity that has no flaws is that of a learner. Because even when we fail, we can learn from that experience. He says, learner is the identity that trumps all other identities. Um, he, he shares so many other things here. There's a quote from Tom Bilyeu that was great. It says, the only belief that matters is that if you put time and attention into getting better at something, you will get better. You don't need to be special. And I love that concept, right? We need to trust that if we focus on getting better at something, we will get better. Secret number seven, uh, this is the last one I'm going to share from Russell, is the call to contribution. And I told you previously about four of those human needs. In, there's two other needs, and those are growth and contribution. The next speaker, uh, the final speaker, was Allison Prince. And she talked about Strat she told about her story, and she's told about strategies that she uses to, to grow very successful e-commerce companies. She talked about how the e-commerce industry has opened up to a mad rush of new customers. With COVID and the pandemic, there's a lot more people buying online, and, and they're projecting a lot more people buying online this holiday season, so get online now. She told her story. She was a junior high teacher. Um, she had a coupon binder, a massive coupon binder she showed us a picture of. And she had a belief that money was hard to get. She felt that she had to save her way to get to a million dollars. So she read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the book. Someone recommended it to her. And she stopped focusing on learning to save and she started focusing on learning to create. She had a severe scarcity mindset. She stood up and she proclaimed that she's next. She saw these people being successful in the ClickFunnels world and she decided, I am next. And that's a phrase that she had us repeat many times during a presentation and as she teaches, she has, has people uh, repeat that phrase. She told us that our future self is waiting for us. She had a couple of daughters that she taught while they were in elementary school and junior high to, to do e-commerce businesses, and both of them had achieved six figures of revenue before they even entered high school. She talked about kind of the paradigm shift of, of giving a gift and, and, and what we sell um, in the product. So, for example, someone gave her a gift of paper plates, but they didn't really give her paper plates. When they gave her the gift, they said, I'm going to give you the gift of not having to do dishes for a month. Um, so she was that when you're selling paper plates, you can be selling the gift of not having to do dishes instead of selling paper plates, right? It's focusing on, on kind of that, that benefit or problem to be solved instead of focusing on the product. Uh, skipping through a few things here. So another really cool point that I love, she she talked about instead of copying someone else's product, she searches trends and then she finds two trends and puts them together. So maybe bags are trending and burlap products are trending and so she puts them together and makes burlap bags. Or maybe Cupcake Wars is trending and, and so people are buying cupcake, um, I don't even know what those are called, but they, you, you cook, they're reusable containers to cook cupcakes in. Maybe people are buying a lot more of that, and maybe in the fashion world, 
polka dots are trending. So you put those two together and, and create a new product by, by combining two trending items. That's one of her big secrets. She told a story of a company that sold a protein powder or sells a protein powder. And the problem that that company was solving prior to the pandemic was trying to get people in shape. And that was their message, you know, buy our product and build big muscles and look great. Um, but the problem after the pandemic, people weren't as, as focused on that. And in, the company shifted their messaging. And at that time, there was food shortages. And there were people who were scared about their food security. And so the company remarketed and said, we have a protein powder that is sh a shelf-stable protein that you can store and have available if, if you're not able to get food for your family. And, and they were able to do very well with that. She talked about how we need to sell solutions to problems and not products. She talked about uh, some blocks of wood that she sold that paid off her minivan in one day. Um, she talked about her daughters who were able to sell 21,000 scarves before they stepped into high school. She talked about a teacher. And these are just examples she get, she's given of customers that she's worked with and coached. She talked about another teacher who started it in April and generated 28 times her income already. Um, she talked about don't steal other people's products, take trends and combine them. She talked about right now, don't try to order overseas um, because of how long it's taking uh, to get those products and, and with Christmas coming up so quickly. She says that it's better right now to go with wholesalers. She normally wouldn't recommend that, but go with U.S.-based wholesalers that you can buy from and get the product in just a couple of days. She said this also allows you to get samples quickly and encourages us to get those first so we can make sure that the product is high quality. She said, don't sell junk, don't ruin the reputation of, of the funnel hacking community. Um, she said that ordering from wholesales also allows us to order in smaller quantities so we don't have to, to put a whole bunch of our money into inventory, waiting for it to sell. She said that selling out is good. Don't stress about that. Then as you order more, you can tell people that it's been sold out and, and uh, that more is available and you can actually create more demand for the product. So the question that came to my mind through this presentation, she was really good at finding the product, but I wanted to know how she marketed the product. And, and that was really a curious question for me because she said that she didn't put any money into advertising. And, and the way she did it is she worked with the influencers and she found influencers who had audiences that might be interested in that product. She, and then she established three-way win-win relationships with those audiences and paid them as they were able to sell her product. And that also adds credibility as you get an influencer who's recommending the product to a group of people that they know, like, and trust. That's going to be much easier to, to sell the product and getting, get it going. All right. Uh, I, I think that is a lot for today. Uh, we kind of like a fire hose. We had a lot uh, blasted at us today and, and uh, learned a ton. Like I said at the beginning, it was a day that kind of left us feeling invincible, like we could kind of take on the world in our, our marketing and business ventures. So thank you so much for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, you can follow Monetization Nation, which is my show, on our Facebook group, on our podcast, um, on our YouTube channel, um, on, on any of the popular podcast platforms, on our blog at monetizationnation.com, Instagram, any of our other channels. Um, you can also download my free ebook about passion marketing at passionmarketing.com. And I wish you success in your venture as you strive to implement all of these amazing things we were taught today. Have a wonderful night.